How well has your pension performed over the last five years? Can you answer that question? I'm sure you might know how much it's grown, but do you know if that's good or bad? Whether you're picking your own funds or just relying on the default funds that are picked for you, the only way that you can understand how well you're doing is if you have a benchmark to compare it against. Without a benchmark, you're just flying blind. So in this video, I'm gonna show you the performance of the benchmarks that I like to use so that you can compare it with your own performance and help you identify whether it's time to make a change. Hello and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, hi, my name is James. I am a financial planner and this is a place where you can learn to make smarter financial decisions. The last few years have been pretty rough for investors, which might have you sitting there questioning whether you're the only one feeling this pain. Or you might be thinking, what are you talking about, mate? My returns have been great. But have they really? Well, it's time to find out. With this exercise, we're trying to understand what average performance has looked like over the last five years from the perspective of a UK investor. But before we get into this, you should know that although past performance is interesting to look at, it should never be the only reason you decide to make changes to your investments. And as we go through these examples, you'll see that there is actually a lot more that goes into picking appropriate investments. We're going to look at four different risk-based portfolios made up of a combination of two global indexes one for stocks and one for bonds. For stocks, we're using the FTSE Global All Cap Index, which aims to track the performance of the global stock market across companies of all sizes. This tracks over 9,000 companies, and here we can see its global allocation. The US market makes up 60% of this index, whilst the UK only makes up 4%, which matches the global makeup of equity markets. A global index like this should be the benchmark for any globally diversified stocks and shares investor, because this should shows us what the average return has been. And you can very easily achieve these returns by investing in a cheap passive fund that tracks this index. For bonds, we're gonna use the Bloomberg Global Aggregate Index, which aims to track the performance of the global investment grade bond market. With bonds, there is so much more nuance and variety than with stock. So coming up with a true global tracker is hard, if not impossible, but this is a pretty decent proxy. And we're then gonna combine these two indexes into four different portfolios. One of 100% stocks, then 80% stocks and 20% bonds, 60, 40, and 40, 60. For this analysis, I've also added in a fee of 0.5% per year to simulate the fund and platform fees that you might expect to pay within your pension, which means we now have then four globally diversified passive portfolios across varying degrees of risk. And given that you can easily replicate these portfolios yourself by investing in funds that track these indices, I think these make good benchmarks to compare against other globally diversified investments. So without looking at the data, how would you expect these portfolios to perform relative to each other? Well, we know that stocks typically outperform bonds over the long term. So we would expect portfolio one to have the highest return and portfolio four to have the lowest. But we also know that stocks tend to be much more volatile than bonds, which means that during times of economic uncertainty, the value of portfolio one is likely to fall much further than portfolio four. This is principle number one of investing. If you want to try and achieve higher returns over the long term, you should have a higher allocation to stocks than to bonds. It's that simple. But to achieve those higher returns, you're going to have to endure a lot more pain as your portfolio is likely to fluctuate in value dramatically. This is the trade that all investors make short-term pain for long-term gains. The challenge then is working out just how much pain you can handle, because if you end up taking too much, you will have a very stressful investing experience that will likely lead to you making mistakes. And you'd probably be better off just picking a portfolio with a blend of stocks and bonds that can help you temper the volatility of your portfolio. So let's look at the data. Here we're looking at how each of these portfolios has performed over the last five years up until the end of May. On the y-axis, we have the performance, and on the x-axis, we have the portfolio's volatility, which is often used as a measure of risk, or as I like to say, pain. And as we can see, yes, as expected, the higher the risk, the higher the returns. Portfolio four has had the lowest return of 16% over five years, whilst portfolio one returned 45%. Does this mean that portfolio one is better than portfolio four? No. It doesn't because they are trying to achieve different goals and taking different levels of risk. This is the big problem when trying to compare performance. 
If you're looking at a fund and it's achieved a 40% return over the last five years, looking at this data, can you tell whether that's good or bad? Well, if it's taken a similar level of risk as Portfolio 3, then yes, that's pretty damn good. But if it's taking this level of risk or even higher, well, that's not good at all. So just be mindful that whenever you're comparing performance, you need to be comparing apples with apples and only comparing funds that are taking similar levels of risk, which is why I'm giving you four different benchmarks instead of just one. This is Portfolio 1, the 100% equity portfolio. Over the last five years to the 23rd of June, it's up 46%. But as you can see, the journey to get there has been very volatile. And there have been three occasions when this portfolio has fallen by 15% or more. In 2018, it fell 18% on the back of Trump's trade war with China, fears of slowing economic growth and the Fed starting to raise interest rates. Then during coronavirus, it crashed by 25% followed by a big run-up as central banks started pumping money into the economy, only for the market to get ahead of itself and then fall 15% from its last all-time high in November 2021. If you want to achieve high returns, this is the type of pain you are just going to need to get used to. And of course, at times, it will get even worse than this, like during 2008, when this portfolio fell by 40%. But this is what we sign up to as investors. No pain, no gain. Portfolio number three, on the other hand, which is 60% stocks and 40% bonds, achieved 25% over the period. But we can see it's been much less volatile. As an example, during the coronavirus crash, where portfolio one fell 25%, this portfolio only fell by 165 However, because this portfolio has a large allocation to bonds, over the last 18 months, as interest rates have risen and bond prices have fallen, the bond part of this portfolio has suffered a lot more than usual, which is even more apparent if we look at the performance of Portfolio 4 that has a 60% allocation to bonds. So here we have four different benchmark portfolios that you can use to compare against your own investments. But to do this, you're firstly going to need to make sure that you're comparing over the same time period, which can be hard to do if the data that your pension provider gives you is limited. So to make that easier, down in the description, you will find a document that details the performance of these four portfolios over different time periods. And I will try to keep this up to date over time. If you notice that your performance is lower than portfolio one, it's probably because you're invested in a fund that has a lower allocation to stocks. So check what you're invested in. And if you find that you're only invested in, let's say 60% stocks, then just make sure to compare it with the appropriate benchmark. If you're not sure how you're invested or which benchmark is appropriate, leave me a link to the fact sheet of the fund that you're invested in down in the comments and I will tell you which benchmark to use. So what should you do if you find that you are underperforming? Well, if it's just by a few percent over five years, this is not necessarily a reason to be concerned because these benchmarks may not be perfect comparisons for exactly how you're invested. But if you find that you've underperformed significantly, then alongside the performance figures down in the description, you will find a four-step guide to help you identify why and whether you might need to be making changes. On the other hand, if you find out that you have outperformed, does this mean that you are doing well and then don't need to make any changes? No, not necessarily, because it depends on how you have achieved that return and whether it's likely to be sustainable. Let's say that you achieved a 58% return over the last five years. It's certainly better than our 100% equity benchmark, but you've taken a huge amount of risk to achieve it. And maybe you just got pretty lucky. So should you keep taking that risk? Probably not, especially when you realize that this is just the performance of Amazon stock. And I'm sure that you can appreciate why continuing to invest in a single company would be a very bad idea. So what about this one? It's achieved a higher return than portfolio one, and it's taken a similar amount of risk. So it looks pretty good, right? But this is actually just a global index that is very similar to portfolio one. The main difference being that it excludes the UK. So yes, the UK has underperformed over the last five years, but does that mean it will continue to do so? No, we have no idea whether it will or not. Of course, the future for the UK doesn't look great, but everybody already knows that. And that information is already baked into the market. So 
unless you know something that everybody else doesn't, don't make bets on any one country or sector. And instead, you should be maintaining global diversification. There are so many more pitfalls of relying on past performance to pick investments that I cannot cover them all in this video. But when I am selecting funds for clients, the past performance of the fund barely even comes into the decision-making process. And if you wanna learn why that is, you should be watching this video here, where I explain the biggest mistakes that I see people make when picking funds. I'll see you there.